Hello, a very good evening. It's coming up to four minutes past four. Welcome to the LBC UKIP leadership debate. It's the first time the four candidates have debated each other. They're here live taking your questions for the next hour. They are uh, the leader of UKIP in the European Parliament, Paul Nuttall, former Deputy Chairman Suzanne Evans, Culture Spokesman GLA member Peter Whittle and former UKIP candidate uh, for Cardiff, John Rees Evans. 0345 6060 973. And you can watch the whole debate on the LBC website at lbc.co.uk and on Facebook Live on the LBC Facebook page. Well, welcome to all four Hi. of you. We're going to get straight into it and go to the calls. Uh, Victoria is... Put, you need to put your headphones on, by the way. All right. Uh, it's, it's radio, after all, <laughs> even though people can watch. Uh, Victoria <laughs> is in Stansted. Victoria, what's your question? Oh, hello there. Good afternoon. Um, I agreed recently um, with Stephen Wolfe who um, claimed that UKIP is ungovernable and in a death spiral. And I wondered who you think is to blame for that state of affairs. Suzanne Evans. Ungovernable? You just watch me. I'll show you, Victoria. <laughs> it's definitely not ungovernable. You know, we might have had some troubles in the past, but all political parties go through tough spots. But uh, I think UKIP, we had four million voters at the general election. We have a great manifesto on which to build more policies. I think we have a real opportunity now because the Labour Party is so utterly failing working people in this country. I think this is a world of opportunity for UKIP out there. And if I'm leader, I cannot wait to get started. But with all of the things that have gone on since the referendum, Nigel Farage's will he, won't he sort of continue or not, uh, with what happened with Diane James, with the, the role of the National Executive Committee, which I know is a bit of a sort of Westminster bubble thing. But your party is seen by the outside world as in a complete and utter mess and ungovernable. But you don't seem to recognise that description. We have the chance to wipe the slate clean. We're here, all four of us, all good candidates who I know can take the party forward. And that's where we must start from. We actually, I said wipe the slate clean. I think I, think I actually want to clarify that. We have a great legacy that Nigel Farage has left us that we can build on. But now, chance for a new leader to perhaps take a well, slightly new approach. Hang on a minute, because you, you said that UKIP's image was toxic. That surely no. is Nigel Farage's legacy. No, well, you no, did no. it. I heard, I heard you say it myself. No, I, used, I, I didn't say that at all. I mean, why would I be in a party if I thought that was the you truth? You said the party in, needs said, to shed its toxic image. image. You said it on the Andrew Marr show. That's very different from saying it's toxic. We're talking well, about an image. And I'm in UKIP and part of the reason I want to lead UKIP is because I want to show a wider range of people just how fantastic okay. UKIP is and uh, what great policies we um, have. John Rees Evans, most people listening to this programme, yeah. with respect, will have never mm -hmm. heard of you. Of course, why, yeah. why do you think that, uh, I mean, first of all, do you think that UKIP is ungovernable and how can you, as somebody from who's relatively unknown, make it mm -hmm. governable? And the fact is, I think that if things continue the way they are, if we have business as usual, UKIP will indeed be ungovernable. I believe that we need to have major reform in UKIP, and I'm not talking about minor configurational changes. I'm talking about implementing a system of internal direct democracy. As long as potential leaders are always vying against each other to determine who should determine the future direction of the party, there will always be conflict. But if we transfer decision-making powers from the leadership to the membership, we will never be in conflict because everybody in this country well, respects so well in the democracy. Party, hasn't it? No, they don't have direct democracy in the Labour Party. UKIP would be the first political party in Britain to implement it. You understand what I mean by I, direct I do democracy. understand what you mean, but um, what I meant by that was Labour has given its members far more power and it actually hasn't helped them, has it? No, no. What I'm talking about has absolutely nothing to do what Labour, with what Labour has done. I'm talking about a highly systematic system whereby every member from everywhere within the country, from the farthest reaches of Scotland, the Outer Hebrides, to, to West Wales, all over the country, people who don't have the opportunity to rub shoulders with the highly placed people in London, they will have just as much opportunity to determine the future direction of the party as the leader himself. OK, Peter Whittle, mm -hmm. is it ungovernable? Uh, completely not, actually. I, th I think that this is one of the, the problems, really, with the whole discussion about us at the moment. Um, 
you know, when you look at most political parties, UKIP is extraordinarily united. Oh, come on. It is you're, extraordinary. You're, you're a rabble. No, we are not a rabble. Look, look, uh, at, look at the conflict in Wales between, between no. Neil Hamilton and the guy that actually was leader of UKIP in Wales. Look at the conflicts between Suzanne and Nigel Farage and, and Aaron Banks's comments over the past few weeks. You are totally disunited. No, no. Look, I'm talking about the membership. We've got 40,000 members. They are extremely united in what they believe. Everybody knows what we believe. And that is extraordinary these days in politics. What we've got to do, of course, is sort out, if you like, the people at the top and get all of that sorted out so we can go forward. Um, I think that the but point what is... what makes you the person to do that? Because For a number of reasons. I think, first of all, UKIP needs a period of stability. My temperament is a stable one. You know, I don't search for conflict. That's for sure. It also... Hang on, let me finish. Who's unstable around the table? No, I'm not well, saying said, that. You said you're stable, so that indicates you think maybe one or two of these aren't. No, it doesn't. But I think that the, basically... Well, why bring it up? Because it's what actually we need as a party. We need, as a party, a period of stability. W- w- we need Nigel a period... Farage unstable? No, no, not at all. But you I just, mean, you you're just said we... You're the one that brought up the word. So yes, therefore because that I... differentiates you from other candidates. That's all I'm trying to point out. No, because uh, what you... you the question you asked me, uh, Ian, was simply that we are a rabble, that we're ungovernable okay. and all the right. rest of it. Do you want to retract that word? No, no, I do not want okay. to. We need a period of stability. We need a period, therefore, of morale boosting. And then we need to be inspired. And those three things are the important steps for you, Kip, going towards the 2020 election. Do you election. think that you are more inspirational than Paul Nuttall? Um, I think that uh, I wouldn't be in this race unless I thought actually that I could do uh, the right job. I think we're all excellent can- he, candidates. He can be quite charismatic when he puts his mind right. to it, can't he? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We all have different skills. But I think that um, what I would say is that it's terribly important at the moment that we have just a period of calm and uh, of rebuilding. But okay. then after that has to well, come I, inspiration. I, I don't think four weeks of a leadership contest is the recipe for calm, but there we go. Um, Paul Nuttall, um, you, you are p- pitching yourself as the hmm. unity candidate. How, how can you govern what I've just described as a rabble? Uh, well, uh, going back to Victoria's question, Ian, uh, y- we haven't covered ourselves in glory. Uh, not just over the past couple of months, but probably over the past uh, past year, really. Uh, UKIP uh, has been dysfunctional. Uh, it's quite clear. And I think UKIP at the moment is basically peering over the edge of a political cliff. And it will either step off or it will step back. And I believe I'm the best candidate to ensure that UKIP doesn't step off that political cliff simply because I've done every major job in the party. I've been the party chairman. I've been the head of policy. I've been the deputy for six years. I lead the MEPs. I've got the most experience by a country mile. I'm not part of any faction or or other. We need someone to come in now, bring everyone together, uh, unite, come behind a banner, let bygones be bygones, forgive but not forget so who, and move forward. Who is responsible for taking the party to the edge of this cliff? Uh, I think, uh, basically, I don't. Uh, I said this in my conference speech. Nobody is coming out of this with their head but, held I mean, high, OK? You, you, I wasn't necessarily... I don't probably think I was talking about Nigel yeah. Farage then. I wasn't, actually. No, I was not. talking about you, because you have been deputy leader I agree. for... How, how long is it? Six years. And Ian, so, so you've in my got conference, to take your responsibility absolutely. And in my that. In my conference speech, I made it clear that I am partly to blame for this. We now need to move on, let bygones be bygones, and ensure that it is Daisy. So, Hold so, on, so what you're saying, it's like Gordon Brown saying, well, I've wrecked the no, economy, no, 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 but no, no, please no. make me prime no, minister. No, hang on, hang on. It needs to be day zero for the new leader of this party, and everybody has to move on because we have a fantastic opportunity. There are open goals in British politics. You just look at working class communities where the Labour Party don't represent many people anymore. But we have to be on the pitch to kick that ball in the net. And I believe I'm the best candidate okay. to ensure you can. Victoria, stay on the pitch. very quickly, who do you, what do you like of what you've heard? What you what don't you like? Um, I'm a Tory voter, but I like what Suzanne Evans says, and I'll watch to see if she can unite the party um, to follow her vision and if she can, I'll vote for her. OK, well that, ne- that leads into the, in, into the next question <laughs> quite nicely. But do, if you want to watch us, we're on Facebook Live on the LBC Facebook page, you can search for that or you can go to the LBC website at lbc.co.uk. Philip's in Birmingham. Hi Philip, what's your question? Hi there, good evening. My question is, Suzanne, mm-hmm. are you are you a Tory stitch? <laughs> listen, listen, let me just say, right, you've fallen out with Nigel, You've aligned yourself with Mr. Carswell, and Mr. Carswell certainly hasn't got 
you keep at heart. If he did, he'd be sitting right there now with you, shouting from the rafters what a great party this party is, just like Peter did yesterday on the Daily Politics when he said, I love this party with a passion. And so do I. Well, Philip. Suzanne, I'm, I'm going to let you Thank answer you. this in a minute. Okay, I want to fair see. Enough. I want to see what the others think. Do, do you? Do any of you oh, think that Suzanne is a Tory, Paul? No, she's not, and she's not a Tory stooge. She, and she was a Tory. No, no, though. but, but she, 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 she was a Tory party member. She's not a Tory stooge. She's not a planter or anything like that. Look. UKIP has got to move beyond this. It's got to move beyond Carswell I UKIP, Farage UKIP. It has to be UKIP. A UKIP for everyone. A big tent where no one's marginalised and all talents are utilised. And that's what I'm going to bring to the table. John? Well, I will concede that I've heard um, such conjectures in the past, but I'm, I don't want to comment uh, on whether or not I think that she may have more well, affinity with well, the Well, we are trying to have party. a debate here. The, no, the no, whole I'll, point I'll, is no, for no, you no. to let, let comment. Me, let me tell you why, because what, you, what you're actually trying to do is to get us to all attack no, each no, other. No, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to get you to do anything. I'm trying to get you to answer the question that Philip put to you. That's what you're here to do. I, I will answer the question, and I was in the process well, you... of answering the question. I don't have sufficient data on Suzanne Evans to know well, whether, where, where, whether she where has you been stronger for the past few years in in Wales. What? I don't know whether she has stronger affinity with the Tory party than UKIP. I'm I'm open minded on the subject. Okay, I'm willing to be convinced either way. Okay, what, now what so, convinced you out of interest because it sounds to me like you've already mm -hmm. made your mind up about me. We've only just met. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what would convince me, Suzanne, if you were to retract a comment that you made about a candidate who was democratically elected by a ratio of 10 to 1 in the London Assembly hustings. I think you know the one I'm referring Alan to. Alan Cray. What's that yes, got yes, to yes. do with my being a Tory plant or not? Uh, well, no, I will tell you exactly what it's got to do with it because the Tories like to dictate top down, whereas UKIP believes in freedom of conscience. Yeah, you can mock. You, you know, you, uh, did you work for the BBC? I mean, by all means, mock. OK, but the reality is that UKIP believes in freedom of conscience. And when you tell the public on a forum, on the internet, that it is unacceptable for a person to have traditional Christian views. That doesn't sound he, UKIP to me. Look, I don't want to get into this argument because... I'm sure well, you don't. Well, well, well actually, no, let's get into views, this argument because I think that this, this actually shows where, where there are very different views here. Alan Craig, for, uh, former leader of the Christian People's Alliance, has made very many homophobic comments in the has past. He? Could you tell me oh, one? Well, as I start, sit here, obviously I haven't got the quotes in front of me. Well, but I I've, but I've interviewed. I've interviewed. I've interviewed. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I've Sorry. interviewed him several times, so I know exactly what Mr. Craig's views are. Uh, Suzanne was taking him on on his homophobia. Now, sh shouldn't any politician want to be able to do that? Any politician in a capacity as a person commenting on another person's views can say whatever they like, okay? I'm a libertarian, okay? What the deputy leader of a party cannot do is to override a democratic process that's happened in a hustings whereby people have democratically elected somebody by a majority of 10 to 1 and essentially trash his reputation online. And when subsequently he asks her to meet and say, please, could we discuss this? Because I think you've misapprehended my views she doesn't take any kind of opportunity to meet with him and thrash things out and ensure Suzanne? that there's reconciliation. OK, a few things. First of all, I knew that Mr Craig had been refused permission to be a candidate twice, so I thought there had been a mistake. And I think as deputy chairman of the party, I had a responsibility to highlight, as I did privately, that there had been a mistake. UKIP is a party that, as you say, is libertarian. It enjoys a, a wide range of views, it absolutely stands up for people's rights and responsibilities and it respects that people have different views. However, I think there is a higher bar for our candidates than there is for an ordinary member of our party. And I think any candidate that expresses views which alienate a large section of our community is someone who, you know, needs to perhaps reconsider their commitment uh, as uh, a okay, candidate. Okay. So and if, all I have sorry. done, if I can just say... Mm -hmm. You know, I also think part of the reason I think I make a good leader mm -hmm. is because I do stand up 
for what I believe in. I will not tolerate racism. I will not tolerate homophobia. I will not tolerate discrimination. So everyone has and to agree I, with you no, or you throw them out of the party. To they don't have right to stand. I've not thrown anyone out of the party. You said he but should stand, stand down and shouldn't have got through the vetting for process. for what I believe in. And so do I, and so does Alan Craig. Well, that's fine. Yeah, look, look, I don't mind what you believe. I'm happy for you to believe whatever you want to believe. But don't tell me what to believe. Right, don't well, tell Alan Craig what to believe. I'm not telling John, you John, what to believe. John, John, let's, let's, you asked for a quote from Alan Craig. Craig. Let, okay. let me let okay. me see what you think of this. Let's go for it. In an article for the Church of England newspaper, yes. Alan Craig wrote that gay rights stormtroopers take mm-hmm. no prisoners as they annex our wider culture, adding that the legalisation of same-sex marriage was proof that Nazi expansionist ambitions are far mm-hmm. from sated. Do you think that's something that a UK candidate should be saying? Do, do you know, it's interesting because my campaign manager, who happens to identify himself as gay, would say pretty much the same thing. He very much opposes this militant attitude that a lot of the LGBT so he, he identifies yeah. himself as yeah. gay. What does yeah, that so, even sorry, mean? I, I, don't, I don't know was it, what, what... Was he what, not yeah. born gay? Um, I, I don't know. I'm not a scientist. So, uh, I've, you know, ne- I've never heard anyone use that expression before. Okay, so, that's sorry, do you, do you want me to do, answer do the question believe, or do you want do you to have a semantical that people debate? people were born gay? I want you to answer that question. I, I haven't got a clue. OK, ask a scientist. OK, but you asked me a previous but I do question. Know that. OK, well, OK, maybe you do. Maybe you know more about it than me. But can we answer the question you asked, which was what? Is that acceptable for a UKIP candidate to say that on a public platform? It it is entirely acceptable for a UKIP candidate to have any views that he likes. Racist views? Well, well, look, the reality... No, no, seriously, if if you can be homophobic, surely a UKIP candidate can be racist? Yes, yes. So, yes, OK. No, 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 I've just said (laughs) yes in the sense that I understand what you you are saying. Well, what's the answer to the question? OK. Firstly... I'd need you to define what you mean by racist. I think we all know what racist means. If you no, really need no. that defined for you, okay, I'm no. not sure you should be sitting in that chair. Uh, uh, are you assuming that your listeners are simplistic? Because, no, I'm, because, assume, because I'm the assuming is, that they're seeing through no. your ridiculous comments at the moment. You okay, know okay. you know let's, exactly let's what ad, racist ad, ad, means. Okay, ad hominem do you, attacks. Do you know what okay. racist means? Racist can be interpreted in two ways. One is that it differentiates between people on the basis of race. Yeah. Okay. Another is that it treats people unfairly because of their race. What do you mean when and, you uh, talk uh, about well, race? Well, let, let's talk about the second one of those. Okay. Do you think it's acceptable for a no, UKIP candidate not. to hold no, those views? No, of course so not. So why do you why do you think it's okay for a UKIP candidate to be homophobic? He's not homophobic. Well, Listen, what, what, how else would you describe those comments? What he is saying is that the LGBT militant wing, not people who happen to be gay or lesbian or uh, bisexual or transgender, not individual people who do that, but people who go and they protest against evangelicals, Christians' rights to have their own views, these people okay. are, you know, are, are militant right. and don't P- have a right to Peter to Whittle, do that. Uh, yeah. let's get back to the question. Is Suzanne a Tory? <laughs> <laughs> or Tory Stooge, I think, was the uh, or plant. <laughs> no, I mean, look, uh, we've all come in this party from different parties. Uh, many of us, I think, there are quite relatively few people actually in UKIP who haven't been in, involved in another party at some form or time. I was a Tory, you know, and up until about two thousand and five, for what it's worth. Uh, there are many people who've been in Labour, you know, now uh, in the Labour Party, should I say. And uh, basically, you know, it's pretty much uh, an absolute okay. mixture. So, you're, so, so you're not, you won't throw that at Suzanne? No, I won't throw that ex- at Suzanne at all. I, I do, though, take exception to some of, um, you know, uh, John's uh, remarks here. I mean, you know, first, it has to be made clear, you know, this party chose as its mayoral candidate a gay man, i.e. me, the only mayoral candidate who was gay, right? Um, So basically, your comments are not representative and uh, the comments that you've actually made, you know, recently so, so are what, not what representative, comments? John. So what, what comments, Pe- Peter? I'm well, got no, uh, ones in the last five minutes for a no, start. No, 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 they're not. No, I, I was think trying the to answer this, Ian, a convoluted that, question. Listen, the problem with this, in, in a way, is that basically we are going down talking about very relatively obscure people, relatively arcane matters that basically can't be of much interest to the people not. We're talking about a very important principle and that is liberty of conscience. I don't care what sexuality a person is. If they love their country and they want to serve, I'm happy to work with them. But what is not acceptable is for Suzanne to say that because a person has traditional views, he cannot be a candidate they, they in the UK. They're not traditional It is a traditional view. I mean, well, this, okay. this, well, let, this look, country has a strong view about this in the next hour, we, but we I think could, we, we need yeah. to move on. Suzanne Evans, you stand accused of being a Tory plant. Um, I gave up possibly a job for life as a Conservative councillor in one of the safest wards in my area. 
I did so out of utter conviction that the Conservative Party was not serving the people of this country and UKIP was. I stand by that. I have no regrets. If I was a Tory plant, I think given some of the accusations I've had thrown at me in the last 18 months, I would have run quite some time ago. I think my loyalty to this party, the fact that I'm sitting here in this chair, should tell you everything you need to know about my loyalty uh, to uh, my party. Are you relieved Raheem Kassam is not sitting in that chair? <laughs> Although after the last few minutes, she may wish she was. I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think Raheem, Raheem is a very talented young man, actually. Uh, I, I think he could go far in life but I think he needs to perhaps use his talents in a wiser way in future. But are, are you relieved he, he did drop out in the end? I'm not sure it's relief it because, you know, he had fire, every right to stand. Um, but, but uh, yeah, he's made his decision to stand down and I mean, I'm sure that was the right one. It would have been an uglier fight if he had been involved in this debate. I'm not and... so sure. <laughs> okay. Can I just um, say, Raheem, this was a very civilised guy. You know, he's not going to start kind no, of like tearing he, the place he, down. Let's face it, he has a divisive reputation. We all saw the tweets and everything. Um, Adam in Barnes has text, texted, quick answer to this, all four of you, if we can. Is Douglas Carswell a force for good in UKIP, Paul Nuttall? He can be in the future. But, uh, but, but he isn't but, at the moment. Hang on, hang on. What we. What we need to do is to bring everyone in together. And um, If I'm elected leader, one of the first things I will do is I will go to the House of Commons and I'll meet with Douglas. I'll go and see Lord Pearson in the House of Lords. I'll go and see Neil Hamilton in the Senate. I'll go and see the MEPs which I lead in the European Parliament, the NEC, and basically ensure that everyone comes together. And it can happen and it can work. Uh, Peter Whittle. Um, yeah, I think that uh, what I would say is that uh, we should have a period where we all try to sort out quite what the situation is, p particularly with, with Douglas. We've had books come out recently about the referendum, for example, and they have sort of said about what basically Douglas's plan, as it were, was with UKIP. Well, or, or with, this which was allegedly to <clears throat> undermine Nigel Farage. That That's was the right. reason he joined. That's right. So basically, you know, these are in books, these are in publications. I've not heard, <coughs> excuse me, I've not heard Douglas say anything about this. I'd like to get to the bottom of it. Um, what's, certainly well, the, <coughs> what's certainly the case, though, is that uh, basically at the moment, it does feel very much like we have a semi-detached MP. Well, Suzanne Evans, you work for this semi-detached MP in, in his parliamentary office. Presumably you've had these conversations with him. Presumably you've asked him whether he uh, intended to undermine Nigel Farage as, when he joined UKIP. I, I have, and he did not. Uh, Douglas is one of the most principled men I met. And I think, you know, all of us around this table, I'm sure if we believed everything that was written about us in the newspapers, we, we, we'd, we'd go mad, actually. Uh, people in UKIP, I think, we have to look at what Douglas brings to the party and actually having a member of parliament in the House is a great asset. But he's been a very us. divisive influence in UKIP, has he not? I think some other people have tried to paint him out as being divisive for actually doing nothing more than, as Jonathan has just said, having his own opinions and perhaps putting across UKIP policy in a slightly different way to Nigel Farage. They have a very different tone. But, you know, when Nigel was on LBC on Sunday morning, I was listening to him. And at one point he was talking about corporatism. That's interesting in and itself. cronyism. Oh, no, I always enjoy listening to Nigel. He was talking about corporatism and cronyism. And I thought, my goodness, those words could have come out of Ni Doug Douglas Carswell's mouth. But, they actually have more in common than you would think. But Nigel Farage once said to me, I think it was live in this studio, he said that Douglas Carswell was a cuckoo in the UKIP nest. Hands up if you agree with that statement, because he certainly really did. Uh, okay, well... No, none of you? Uh, no, okay. well, I mean, I wouldn't put my hand up because I need to qualify my response. Okay, but what did um, disappoint me immensely about Douglas Carswell is that at a time where we needed lead leadership and unity, uh, he came out quite clearly, um, critically, against Nigel Farage. I think that, that, was, that was unfair. So you're not allowed to criticise the leader in this party? Y you are allowed to criticise that, that rather... what the leader does, but no. Don't criticise a leader. Criticise what he does. Do you think the leader should okay, be criticising other people in the look, party look, as okay, well? It's like this, Suzanne. If you have a child, do you just tell the child they're useless and they need to go? Or do you look at a problem that they're having and say, look, let me help you with this. Let's discuss it. Let's work something Guys, out. guys, all, look, this is all looking backwards. It's OK? Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to do that. Yeah. We all want right. to look forward. OK, well, let's yeah. look forward with By our next reason. questioner. Sarah's in Tooting. Hello, Sarah. Yes, hi. I do have to say, um, I'm beginning to find... This debate really, I almost put the phone down and didn't continue. Because well, I'm sorry to hear that. I've got a, well, I've got a question. 
And I'm keen to put it, but I nearly actually hung up halfway because all I can hear are people barracking each other. I can hear you interrupting them. I'm trying to follow a train of thought and then you interrupt. One of them is, well, you've got one man shouting over another. I'm not getting any clear. Um, and I am. <laughs> I did vote UKIP last time round. So for me, well, it's actually quite important to get a feel. Um, OK, and Sarah, well, what's I mean, your question? You know, when you're carrying on with this, that you try, all of you, to bear in mind your listeners. The mm. question I've got is, since the Labour Party seems to have an ineffectual male leader and the Conservatives seem to have a strong female leader, what do you think that having a female leader for UKIP would give the party an edge over Labour and would also bring you level with the Conservatives? Uh, John Rees Evans. Now, no, I think that's entirely flawed reasoning. You know, I, I employ about 800 people and I don't employ anyone on the basis of their gender, their race, their sexuality. I employ them on the basis of merit. Peter? Um, it shouldn't make any difference at all. Um, I think, you know, frankly, it's a question of what that person says. It's as simple as that. There are, you know, huge numbers of people in this country who loathe and detest Mrs. Thatcher, for example, like Margaret Thatcher. Hate, you know, and that includes many, many women. Uh, and the, the fact is, just because she was a woman leader did not automatically mean that people would vote for her, women would vote for her. So, and that's actually as it should be. I wouldn't expect the uh, people of London, the gay guys of London, to have voted for me as a gay mayor. I would be on a hiding to nothing if and, I and did. I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Suzanne Evans, it, it, it's interesting you, you had a female leader for all of 18 days. How can we be sure that you would last longer? I made a pretty tough stuff, me. I think you know that, Ian. Um, Peter's absolutely right. What gender you are really shouldn't matter. And, uh, and you know, I, I don't think it will to our members. They will choose the best man for the job, whether that is a man or a woman. Paul? I think it's irrelevant. Uh, I think it's what you do and what you say and how you act uh, and the agenda which you push. Uh, as for Theresa May, uh, she seems to be doing a half-decent job at the moment, but I'm pretty sure the honeymoon period won't last that long and we've got to be there to ensure that we hold the government's fire to the feet, uh, feet to the fire on Brexit and we don't end up getting some sort of mealy-mouthed version where we end up in the single market we, and, and we're stuck with freedom of movement of people, we're stuck handing over okay. more money to Brussels and we can't control our own laws. Well, we're halfway through our debate. We're here with you until six, or at least I'm with you until seven, but our four candidates are here uh, with you until uh, six. So, so uh, let's have a little bit of a breather now and get the LBC News headlines at half past five with Rupert Bartier. It's coming up to 25 to 6. We're halfway through our UKIP leadership debate. With me in the studio are Paul Nuttall. If you, by the way, you can watch us at lbc.co.uk and on the LBC Facebook page. This is Paul Nuttall. He's leader of the UK Independence Party in the European Parliament, former deputy leader. Suzanne Evans wrote UKIP's election manifesto in 2015. She was also deputy chairman of the party. Peter Whittle sits on the GLA. He was UKIP's candidate for mayor of London earlier this year. And John Rhys Evans stood in Cardiff South and Penarth in 2015. He's a former soldier. Right, let's carry on with your calls. Maria is in Loughton. Hello, Maria. Hello, good afternoon. Hello, Maria. What would you like to ask? Yes, I'm a Spanish national and I lived in this country for many years. How responsible do you feel that I had been verbally abused and made feel unwelcome since the referendum and this current Brexit situation? Paul Nuttall. Uh, well, look, I'm very sorry, Maria, if you've been verbally abused, and no one uh, should have to be uh, have to go through that. And uh, but the bottom line is this: uh, I don't feel responsible uh, b because Brexit is a great thing. Brexit means that we are now in control of or will be, hopefully, in the future if Mrs May goes through uh, with what she's promised, but I believe that we should probably move forward with the, and, and abolish the but, 1972 but, hold on, European Communities Act first, and then we can get control of our own borders, we can control our own laws, uh, we'll be able to save a lot of money. We, we don't want to and rehash to, all of those no, arguments, no, we're, we're familiar with those arguments, but, but what Maria is saying that the whole Brexit debate yeah. has meant that she, and, I, and I've heard many other people say this on this radio station, mm -hmm. people from European countries, that 
they have gone through the same experiences as Maria. Now, it will be put in, hiding your head in the sand to, to deny that there must have been some influence because this didn't happen before. Uh, well, if you look at the, the hate crime figures, uh, they didn't go up substantially. Uh, uh, but I will say that I think both sides in the referendum debate uh, pushed the boundaries. I've said this uh, before, but that happens. How, how, did, how well, did your side push the boundary? Well, you, you know, we're talking about the three hundred and fifty million pounds per day and whatnot. But the, uh, but, but, but hang on. What about that Nigel Farage poster um, issued yeah. on on just hours before Joe Cox was murdered? I mean, that that's it. a lot of people thought that was over the top, yeah, and but, that's partly contributing to the experiences that people like. Maria are having. Look, um, that that post had nothing to do with Joe Cox's death. No, so I, I mean, I, no, please don't that. put that in the I, same, no, we, same we, sentence. I know that. Um, look, look. Uh, the but point what, behind was that it the right the, thing the, to do. Well, well, the point behind that poster was absolutely correct. I mean, we do need to get control of our, our borders and there is a deluge of people coming from the Middle East and the European Union's idea of a common asylum policy certainly isn't the right route to go down. But let me finish about quickly about Maria. People shouldn't be put uh, under the tackle, feel threatened. There'll be no one who's asked to leave this country as a result of Brexit. Uh, people who are European nationals who are here will not be forced to go home at all. So please, Maria, don't worry. And UKIP is not that kind of party. But do you accept that there has been a rise in this incident in incidents uh, since Brexit? There has been a slight rise, but you know I've spoken to the police about this, uh, and that happens after any national event. This is nothing out of the ordinary. The rise hasn't been that substantial, uh, and I, again, I feel very sorry for Maria, and she shouldn't have to go through it. But in the end, this will all come down. Brexit isn't going to mean the end of the world. In fact, what it will mean is that we'll be able to hand a better country okay. on to our children. Peter Whittle. Yeah, um, uh, it's terrible to hear that, Maria. Um, the point to make, actually, about the hate crime thing, because we've actually been looking at this uh, in the London Assembly in, in great detail, is that it has, it has been going up anyway. That doesn't excuse what happened to you, uh, but it has been going up. The only point I would make uh, is that in July, uh, straight after the Brexit vote, actually a huge amount of hate crime was actually more related to the various terrorist attacks that were happening at the time. So that might be one of the reasons it's happened. But to get back to your point, I don't think it's fair, Maria. I really don't think it's fair, even though this is bad that's happened to you. So, sorry, Peter, I'm, I'm going to have to pick you up on yeah. that because, I mean, Maria is a Spanish lady. Yeah. Um, why would she be verbally abused by people as a result of terrorist attacks? Because the kind of people who verbally abuse just lash out at anyone. Uh, they, they're not, they're not, they don't know the nuances of what someone is or whatever. Uh, Ma Ma Maria, did you want to come in on that? Yes. Uh, first of all, I don't look that way, and, and so nobody knows anything about me until I open mm. my mouth. Mm. And when I open my mouth is when the abuse starts. It's all to do with you versus Europe to Great Britain. It's, a, it's, it's, it's the war of, of Europe. You created a war. A no, war no, war. This, is, this is ridiculous. We did not create a war. Uh, I mean, the fact is, 17 and a half million people voted in the biggest I don't, I don't democratic think, I don't think you vote. Call, I don't think you should call Maria ridiculous. She, she's no, no, I did not call her ridiculous. Well, you kind of did. She's no. gone through some very painful experiences, clearly, and yeah. she, she thinks that it has only happened yeah. since Brexit. She didn't have this before Brexit, so you can see why she's drawing right. the link. Yeah, no, no, sure. And, of course, newspapers as well have hugely drawn the link. Right. But as I said, hate crime generally is a, as an issue is one that we've got to look at and it has been rising generally even before okay. Brexit. Right. right, John? Yeah, thank you. Um, f firstly, Maria, I'm, I'm extremely sorry to hear that you have been treated in that way. Uh, that's, that's terribly sad and entirely unacceptable. What I think we really need to look at is the irresponsibility of the media in the run-up to Brexit. You see, the media was at pains to castigate UKIP as the originators of Brexit, as racist. And therefore, anyone who em, you know, embraced the cause of border control was therefore, by association, racist. Now, since who, we... Who, know, who was doing this in the media? OK, look, I think you know very well that there have been allegations made against UKIP of racism. You, you, you can't... Yeah. Yeah, OK, all right. Absolutely. Now, now, since UKIP instigated the process of Brexit... Anybody who supported border control was therefore tarnished with the same false allegation of racism. Then when we won, the genuine racists, those ugly people who genuinely dislike people from other countries, 
were essentially encouraged by the the identity of 17 million people as being co-racists with them because if you embraced border control, you were racist. So I think the media needs to take a lot of responsibility for that. Suzanne, was that post a racist? Um, I, I certainly, I don't think it was racist, but I don't like it. I think it was insensitive and ill-judged. Maria, I'm very sorry to hear your story. Um, I know what it's like. I've been abused on the street as well for voting leave. And I think what this means is that if there are some nasty people out there who want to cause aggro, there are nasty people out there who are going to cause aggro and they're going to find any excuse that they can. I think you have a beautiful voice. And um, I'm very proud to say that I'm sitting on a working group at the moment, which is looking at how we can make a better future, a brighter future, a more secure future for EU nationals already living in Britain. And we'll report on that later in the year. Maria, thank you very much indeed for your call. Well, sort of allied to what we've just been talking about, uh, actually, let's talk to Mark in Milton Keynes. Hello, Mark. Hi there. Hello. What's your question? I'm 32 and I've never voted. I just wanted to ask, um, how would UKIP go about obtaining my vote? And I currently believe that the party represents uh, a racist force in the UK. Um, Paul Nuttall. Uh, well, well, look, I mean, UKIP is uh, the only party in Britain which has a blanket ban on anyone who's ever been a member of the BNP or a member of the National Front or any other extremist organisation. I was the party chairman that put that in place. Okay, We're a non-racist organisation. We believe in border control. We believe in an Australian points-based system. But just because you want to control the numbers of people coming into the country doesn't necessarily make you racist. It doesn't matter what colour you are, what creed you are, what religion you are. If you've got the skills that this country needs, please come here and work. That is not a racist position and UKIP is not a racist party. Mark, why do you think UKIP are racist? Well, I haven't had a chance to kind of create a robust uh, report of all the things that have been in the media negatively for and homophobia and all the comments of people within the party, but I think we're all familiar with some of the things you've touched on a few of the homophobic bits there but I've just you know just the things that are out in the media and it, it, it just doesn't come across well it doesn't come across as someone you can you believe that has the best interest for the country when uh, okay I, I mean I'm pro-border control I'm very pro-border control because mm. we need to know you know about people coming into the country but the comments that people within the party have made and been in the newspapers and papers for um, and on the media is it, just unacceptable can I, Peter Whittle yeah can I come in there I mean the, 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 the thing with this though is that whenever anybody has said anything which is unacceptable, racist, whatever, they have been dealt with. They have been got out of the party. And as Paul said earlier, we are the only party that has those kind of restrictions on past membership. I do think there is a problem because you couldn't, uh, with respect there, you couldn't actually say, well, what it is that you, you were basing your comment on about us being racist. I mean, there has been in this country for a very long time, like 20 years, possibly even before UKIP was on the scene, this idea that to talk about re immigration at all was sort of toxic and therefore was therefore racist and therefore we didn't talk about it for a long time. Now, of course, it is absolutely, it is absolutely in the midstream of all political okay. discourse. Suzanne? Mark, your original question, uh, what do you care about? What makes you, what, what would make you get out and vote? What issues uh, do you want UKIP to be talking about? And then I'll see if well, there are anything well, we that we, you could... We haven't uh, got time to go into all of Mark's issues. No, though, maybe you've we, got a top one, Mark. Well, I don't think you should answer a question with a question, Suzanne, if you okay. don't mind no, it's just, it's just, it's just you, you, you did ask, you know, what, what, sort of, <laughs> what, sort of, what sort of things could I tell you? So it's very difficult for me to be able to say exactly to you without knowing what... I think, I think um, one of the things that uh, made me attracted to UKIP is its position on uh, direct democracy. Um, Parliament used to answer to the people. It doesn't anymore. Most MPs are more frightened of their own wits than they are. You're not really answering are. the question, well, so let's move well, on I, to John. Oh, OK, well, okay. I'm... I'm <clears throat> well, I was. well, you are. It was all about why do people think that uh, UKIP are a racist party? No, that wasn't party. Mark's original question. Well, it was, it was, it was, it was how, how would we appeal to him? Yeah, I think how, how we'd get his vote. Yes. Yes, that was the um, original question. <laughs> yeah. And uh, in fact, Mark, I'm, I'm actually very grateful that you've asked this question because the situation you have at the moment is that the people who determine the character of UKIP 
and the direction it should move are the leaders. And so if you have a leader who says something that's either misconstrued or genuinely something bad, therefore the whole party becomes associated with that remark. Under the system that I am proposing, it will be the membership who determines what policies uh, are absorbed into the party's manifesto. So if you don't want UKIP to be a racist party, what would happen? It's very, very interesting that you don't like the idea of consulting the people and direct Suzanne democracy. Suzanne was shaking her head. That's that not what I'm You can't make policy like that. It, yes, it you can. Work you like can. That. I can I explain. Wrote the manifesto. I can tell you it yes, doesn't yes. work like and that. And you're the highly intelligent person that knows far better than all the members. So you're the one who should tell us the direction the party should go. I understand. That's, not that's how precisely that's not why I'm either. in this competition. It's because people like you think they know better than the ordinary people, and that's why I'm running. You, right. Are you well, in this competition we, specifically to attack quickly. me? No, I'm in this competition to implement a system of direct democracy to transfer decision-making powers from the John, leadership to the Paul, membership. you look exasperated. Yeah. Look, 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 look. I'm not look, surprised. Look, look, the, la- the last time that this happened, um, a party had this kind of direct democracy, Jonathan, and I'm a, five a star political historian. But forget the five-star movement. I'm talking, no, about, this com- it, I'm talking about this country. It was Labour, 1983, no, and they came up with the longest Italy, suicide right moment history. Okay, no. we will. Italy right we, now. They didn't have the internet back then. This, yeah. is, this is in Italy. Hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> they got, didn't have got, the internet. We've got back another then. 10 minutes to go, so we'll prepare ourselves for that. This is LBC. <laughs> it's 5.47. Cops versus robbers. The Capulets versus the Montagues. Drivers versus parking wardens. And now, the rivalry to end all rivalries. Epic savings on car versus home insurance. The Strutters saved on their car insurance. The Builders saved on their home insurance. But who is the most epic? Go to Money Supermarket to see where you could save the most. Ian Dale, a drive on LBC. Paul Nuttall, Suzanne Evans, Peter Whittle, John Rhys Evans are with me debating the future of UKIP. They're the four UKIP uh, leadership candidates. Go to our website if you want to watch us as well, lbc.co.uk or on the LBC Facebook Live page. Uh, Yasser is in Mitcham. Hello, Yasser. Hi, and how are you? Very well, thank you. What would you like to ask? Um, I would like to ask a question about the the future of UKIP looks very bright anyway. Um... I wanted to ask, um, how long will Nigel Farage be putting his nose in, into politics, or into UKIP, even though he's been uh, twice, for the party to succeed forward? So, so really, do, does Nigel Farage need to keep out of UKIP for it to succeed? N- Suzanne Evans, I have to come to you first on that one. Hi, Nasa. I used to live in Mitcham, so uh, say hi to it for me, will you? Um, you know, I would love Nigel to stay involved with UKIP if I were leader, because the wealth of experience that he As has... As what, though? As a kind of elder statesman figure. Backseat driver? No, not backseat driver. Elder statesman to whom I could go and say, Nigel, what do you think about this? Because that's how I used to work with Nigel, and it was fantastic. I absolutely valued his expertise, his immense knowledge of history, uh, his his knowledge of foreign affairs. And in much the same way, I think that Nicola Sturgeon now works with uh, Alex Salmond. You know, he's still very much there. He's that elder statesman figure in the party. And, and that's, I think, would be a Peter perfect Whittle. role for Nigel. Uh, look, Nigel is probably the most influential politician of the past two generations. Uh, there's no no question about that. He gave us the referendum. So, yes, I would always want him to be there. I would always want him to be there. Having said that, you've got to actually make sure he wants to be there uh, because at the moment, uh, I think he seems to be enjoying this sort of other platform he's now on, where he's like going to America and going all around the world. Doing LBC radio shows. Doing that sort of thing. That, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, do, do you know, Yasser, if you don't like Nigel Farage, then provided Paul Nuttall wins the leadership contest, you don't have to worry about a thing because Paul Nuttall and Suzanne Evans have already announced their plan to to shunt Nigel off into the political graveyard that is the House of Lords. They don't want to end up. Hang on, Yasser, I'll come back to you in a second. Paul, anyway, you're looking exasperated again. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you know, Nigel and I have worked together for years. Uh, you know, we, we both came at this together. Uh, we both sorted out uh, the party last time I had a similar existential crisis back in 2008. I've been his deputy uh, for six years, and I think it would be fitting internally that Nigel becomes the honorary president of the party. Uh, and I think 
if he wants it and he deserves it, then a period should be on the cards because Nigel, quite simply, even though he hasn't been in the House of Commons, has probably been the most influential politician since John, the turn John of the century. says you're shunting him into a political graveyard if you put him in the House of Lords. Well, you give him the option if he wants to go into the House of Lords. He can go into the House of Lords. Let's not forget... He's not going to be an, an MEP after 2019, and neither am I. So, you know, either he goes into the Commons or we give him a seat in the Lords if it's on offer. If UKIP gets offered peerages, Nigel Farage should be number one on the list. Um, quick text from Paul in Nantwich. Are refugees from Calais a terror threat? John. Do you, do you know, it's fascinating that I should be asked that. Um, well, I'm asking all yeah, of you. No, 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 I haven't no, no, asked okay, you no, no, first no, no, any no, of the no, questions no, no, yet. It's fantastic. So no, I, like, I like it. I like it. Um, because uh, a, couple, a, couple, a couple of days ago, no, a couple of days ago on Bulgarian national TV, they published a story where I actually went to the camp in Kelly and I spoke to migrants to try to understand how it is that they come all the way over here. And I actually spoken to about 39 migrants most of which have made it to the UK. And what I've discovered um, is that they typically will sell their house out in Syria, wherever they come from, spend three and a half thousand pounds travelling across Europe. Firstly, they've got to bribe the officials to get into Turkey uh, out of Syria, which costs about 500. And then by the time they make it to Calais, they've got to find what used to be three grand to smuggle themselves across into Britain, and which is now six grand. So it now costs an average investment of about 10 to 11 thousand pounds to get yourself from the Middle East, your conflict zone, into the UK. Now, I don't say that every migrant that comes here is not genuinely fleeing his life. I happen to know in Cardiff, a Christian who um, was proselytizing a Muslim lady to become a Christian, and he was uh, essentially summoned by the authorities, and it was pretty certain that he'd either go to jail or even face um, you know, the death penalty. So there are certainly genuine migrants. But the reality is, of the 39 I spoke to, it would be my, you know, my own assessment that roughly only three or four of them were genuinely fleeing their lives. Um, you mentioned Bulgaria a couple of times in yeah. this. Is it true you've got some sort of bunker in Bulgaria that you're going to go to if there's a global economic meltdown? This is, uh, what, this is what I've read. Not, I have not at all I know. <laughs> I have, I've not discovered it. Uh, the only subterranean um, property that I have within you, my uh, building... It says your, sorry, your, within, your compound in Bulgaria oh, okay, would protect my, your family in the event you about of global my, meltdown. I'll talk to you about my compound in Bulgaria. You, you know you're getting that out of vice. Okay, do, do, you, do you know anything about vice? They no, go it's around it's the world. the Daily Mirror. Uh, yeah, the Daily Mirror got it directly from Vice. This this chap who okay, wrote this. But is it I, true? Listen, listen. Is it I, true? This guy's a friend. I led an expedition for him in the Pyrenees. Okay, he came to visit me. He asked me to take him shooting. I took him shooting. And, uh, you know, he wanted to make some elaborate story because Vice will only publish something if it's, you know, it's all weird. Okay. So, anyway, the fact is I've got 10 acres. I've got a nice garden wall. Okay. My wife, you know, doesn't like GMO food and orga she likes organic. So we bought some land okay. so we can grow our own All food. Right, you've clear, you've We've cleared got it a well. up. You've cleared Very it simple. up. Um, Peter Whittle, are refugees from Calais a terror threat? Yeah, first can I see, say, in actually, just, just to reassure the view, the listeners and the viewers. Um, well, just answer the question. No, no, no. I mean, the fact is, is that there's a slight distortion in our conversation, actually, because, you know, you're having a lot of fun with John here. And I mean, the, the truth of the matter well, is... he's I've, a funny guy. Yes, I know. He's very funny. Me, but I've never even met him before, so I mean, basically, you know. You see, that, that it, says a lot I'm that he's, he's, I'm he's, he's, he's standing for leader, yeah. and a, none of you have ever met him before. Mm -hmm. No, but yeah. look, that's oh, absolutely right. But, but the yes. fact is, it's what it is, is for people listening, obviously, it might be a good laugh, or whatever, but we're not well, really our, talking about on, the future. Come on, we've of only UK, got five minutes to go. UK. Answer the question Are refugees from Calais a terror threat? I think that uh, with, without question, and this is something that Nigel brought up two years ago and everyone laughed at him and indeed probably called him racist too, is that the migration crisis across Europe was used as a cover for ISIS and for some people. That is a matter of fact now. We know that from the that's attacks. still going on. Of course, why would we think it would not be? I mean, therefore, we have to be absolutely sure and absolutely clear about the people, obviously, that are coming into Britain. Yeah, I would concur with that. Um, Suzanne? Islamic State went on the record and said they were going to try and use those boats coming across the Mediterranean to bring their terrorists into Europe. Our own security services have highlighted the fact that this is a possibility and in perhaps a likelihood. So I think we'd be rather uh, 
rather daft to not take note of that. Uh, um, and what do you make of the suggestion from the Tory MP David Davies that um, the, the so-called child migrants should have their teeth examined to check their age? Do you know, when I when I saw those pictures of the child migrants coming in, I I was actually furious. There are children in desperate need in this country, languishing in children's homes, can't find adoptive parents, can't even find foster care. We, I, I like the rest of the country, was was actually glad that we had the Dubs Amendment in Parliament and we agreed to okay. take child we refugees. Ha- we haven't got time to go into so the whole I subject, but what about been, d- dental I, checks? I, I, are you in favour of those? Yeah. If, if, if Paul, it's children we accept, it should be children we take. Uh, well, th- 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 that... That depends on whether the dental checks are accurate or not, but it's not beyond the wit of man well, to assuming, tell. Assuming they are, it's not beyond the wit of man to tell the age of people who are coming into this country. And quite frankly, we should be checking, and equally, we should know: are these refugees or are they economic migrants? If they're economic migrants, they're breaking international but law, it, the it, Geneva Convention, and this, the Dublin Is this Calais camp being used as a cover for migrant for terrorists? Well, we don't know. We don't know. I, I, I mean, who knows what Pete, will happen? Peter thinks who, he knows. Who knows what will happen in the future? But it could be, I, I mean, look, look. The one thing that we do know is that freedom of movement of people, uh, particularly across the Schengen area, in. Europe, in the EU, has allowed people to drift across borders and not be checked. Okay, It happens with the Paris attack. It also happens okay. with the Brussels attack yeah. earlier right. let's, this year. Let's move on to our next question. If you can be brief in the, follow- in the remaining questions, I'd be grateful because we've only got five minutes or so left. Peter's in Archway. Peter, what's your question, please? Hi. Uh, yeah, hi, Ian. Yeah, my question is about Russia. Uh, I believe that Vladimir Putin uh, has expansionist designs on his, the former Russian sphere of influence in the Balkans. I also suspect that he's a sociopath presiding over... Well, come on, get, get your question right, out, Peter, please. Yeah, uh, extreme right-wing nationalist. Uh, does he pose a threat to uh, our security in the UK? And, uh, and if not, why not? OK, Peter, thank you for that. While our panel are deliberating, uh, let me remind you, you can watch us on Facebook Live via the LBC Facebook page or on the website at lbc.co.uk. So is Russia a threat? If not, why not? And do, maybe do you admire Vladimir Putin? Um, Peter Whittle. Um, he's a pretty unsavoury character. There's no question. Um, I think that, you know, obviously there is an expansion expansionist uh, impulse there. There's no question um, I have to say, without wishing to go over old arguments too much, is that also there's a hugely expansionist uh, impulse in the EU as well. And so this makes for a very, very difficult, very, very difficult and very touchy do you, situation. Do you admire him in any way? No, I mean, I think his people admire him. Uh, his people it's admire him hugely. That's the question I asked. No, no, um, no, I don't. Um, OK, well, why that's, would I, why that's, would I, that's very, well, for Diane, what? Diane Jane, you know? sitting in that very chair during the general election, said she did admire him. Mm. So, John? Yeah, no, I don't really have an opinion about him. I okay, don't think Suzanne. Him uh, he's a man who I think needs very careful handling. I think he does have expansionist ambitions, yes. Uh, I think uh, some of his actions in Syria uh, look as certainly to be as close to war crimes as you can get war crimes. He needs a, he's a man who needs very careful handling. Uh, I tend to agree with Suzanne. He does need careful handling, but I hasten to add uh, that Vladimir Putin and Russia are not the greatest threat to humankind in this century. That's Islamic fundamentalism. Uh, well, that, uh, you, you were very brief there. Thank you very much. Robert's in Finchley. Hello, Robert. Hi, good evening. Um, question, if you become leader of the UKIP, would you prefer to deal with a President Clinton or a President Trump? Mm-hmm. Suzanne Evans. To be honest, I'm glad I'm American and I don't have a vote. But if I am leader of UKIP, I will deal with whichever president of America uh, you're is not, chosen. You know you're not going to get off that lightly. <laughs> no, Who I'm would sorry, you prefer I, to deal I, with, President I, Clinton or President I, Trump? I, I actually do not genuinely have a preference. And as a leader of Britain's third sorry, largest so, political party by vote share... somebody who wants to become chair, a leader, you have no view on who the president of the world's only remaining superpower should be. It's not that I have a view. If you are a leader of a political party, no. you respect democracy, and, Ian, and, and, and I you think, work with I think whoever UKIP is elected. I members listening to this programme can it rightfully expect that you, as a leadership candidate, tell them your view as to who you would prefer to see as President of the United States, because I'm pretty sure these three will. Well, that's fine. They can. But I honestly don't have a view. I would work with whoever it is. Paul. Uh, I've made it perfectly clear. Uh, I don't particularly like either candidate. And if I was American, I'd probably vote for the libertarian candidate who's on 4% at the moment. 
Do you, I'm, I'm um, uh, concerned about some revelations that have come out recently about both candidates. Um, but one thing that I would say in Trump's favour is that he's not in anyone's pocket. I think a lot of people get into politics because they can make money out of it. And I don't think that's the case with Trump. Fact, uh, the fact is, is that if you are leader and you're having to treat with another leader, you have to deal with the person who's been elected. But I'd say this. Uh, Hillary, I think, is a deeply unsavory character like Putin. Yeah. And at the same time, I, uh, with Trump, my feeling is very much right cause, wrong man. I think many of the issues that Trump actually highlights are really important ones. But my God, you know, there's very little to admire in him as a, as a person, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Suzanne, final opportunity? No, I'm not moving. OK. Um, the, <laughs> Paul, Paul, you in the past couple of days have said that you would like to see a referendum on the death penalty. Um, no, I didn't. Well, you, you kind of did. You said if enough people signed a petition... Yeah, but I, vote, yeah, but but I didn't, that how, didn't how, say I wanted how one. You, how would you, how, I wanted one. Well, how would you vote in such a referendum? <laughs> well, it's pretty obvious how I'd vote it. I would Is vote it? in favour of a return for the death penalty for people who kill children, people like Ian Brady and people like Ian Huntley, which is what the majority of British people want. However, this has been UKIP policy since 2005. If enough people sign a petition, I think we, we put it at 5% of the electorate in the last manifesto. I'd probably up it to 10% and, and, and put a time limit on it, but if if enough people sign the petition, it would trigger a referendum. It happens in Switzerland and it works very well indeed. Suzanne? I'm vehemently opposed to the reintroduction of the death penalty. Uh, I always have been, but the case of Stefan Kishko, uh, if you don't know that case, do look it up, yeah, uh, awesome. absolutely clinched it for me. John? I think there'd need to be some pretty um, uh, strict criteria in terms of the, the burden of evidence, but provided that was kind of dealt with, um, yeah, I would vote in favour of the death penalty in the case of specifically paedophiles and child killers. And you think it should be put to a referendum? I, I think many things should be put to a referendum, okay. but using the kind of technology that I'm advocating in my campaign on my website. But sort of all, all proven paedophiles you would give the death penalty to? Yes. Okay, Peter. But 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 sorry, but with with paedophile, I wouldn't necessarily say someone who looked eighteen and was fifteen and a half. So in terms of you know, establishing the parameters for that, it would have to be. But you see that yeah. you see that's interesting because you said yeah. yes, mm -hmm. and then you thought for a minute, and then yeah. you immediately caveat it. Yeah, yeah, now a yeah, leader because, can't do that. Can well, they? well, no. The, the fact is that if you want to make this a semantic debate, we'd have to sit down and we'd each have to. Write it's not a semantic. Shall I answer? Shall I answer? Hang on a second. Because I haven't had the opportunity to clarify my answer. It obviously depends what you define as a paedophile. Okay. In some countries, it's legal to get married. What, what do you uh, define as a Much paedophile? younger. Someone who is pre-pubescent. I would, I would have the death penalty for somebody so who's below, evidently pre-pubescent. Below 12. Yeah. I'd have so 13-year-olds are fair game, are they? They're, they're, they're fair game for the current punishments that we dish out to people right now. Yeah. Peter Whittle. Uh, I don't agree with the death penalty, uh, actually. And I also don't particularly... I think if you're going to have it, you have it for murder or whatever it is. You don't have particular groups that should, you know, have the death penalty. I just don't think there's logic there. Um, it's not a big moral thing, though, I would say. It's not a kind of moral position at all. It's just whether it actually works. I would be much, much more uh, inclined to say that we have to have a much more rigorous general legal system, right? And it's a bit of a red herring, I think, to talk about capital punishment. And, you know, also, I think the majority of people now have moved away from it. I think, you know, in the 1970s... Paul you, hasn't. No, Paul hasn't. But, I mean, the majority of people... I think you used to get huge majorities for it, Paul, it, but you don't anymore. Though, Peter. Well, it might be, but it's uh, kind uh, of... Uh, slim. Uh, uh, on, if you, on, on that if you note, caveat it with children or police officers, it shoots right up to about 80 We, we are going to have right. to finish there. Work. We have gone... A little over our time. Uh, Paul Knuckles, <laughs> Suzanne Evans, John Rees Evans, Peter Whittle, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Uh, if you've enjoyed this so much, you'd... every member from everywhere within the country, from the farthest reaches of Scotland, the Outer Hebrides, to, to West Wales, all over the country, people who don't have the opportunity to rub shoulders with the highly placed people in London, they will have just as much opportunity to determine the future direction of the party as the leader himself. OK, Peter Whittle, mm -hmm. is it ungovernable? Uh, completely not, actually. I, I think that this is one of the, the problems, really, with the whole discussion about us at the moment. Um, 
you know, when you look at most political parties, UKIP is extraordinarily united. Oh, come on. It is extraordinary. You're, you're a rabble. No, we are not a rabble. Look, look, uh, at, look at the conflict in Wales between no. Neil Hamilton and the guy that actually was leader of UKIP in Wales. Look at the conflicts between Suzanne and Nigel Farage and, and Aaron Banks's comments over the past few weeks. You are totally disunited. No, no. Look, I'm talking about the membership. We've got 40,000 members. They are extremely united in what they believe. Everybody knows what we believe. And that is extraordinary these days in politics. What we've got to do, of course, is sort out, if you like, the people at the top and get all of that sorted out so we can go forward. Um, I think that the but point what is... what makes you the person to do that? Because For a number of reasons. I think, first of all, UKIP needs a period of stability. My temperament is a stable one. Hello, a very good evening. It's coming up to four minutes past four. Welcome to the LBC UKIP leadership debate. It's the first time the four candidates have debated each other. They're here live taking your questions for the next hour. They are uh, the leader of UKIP in the European Parliament, Paul Nuttall, former Deputy Chairman Suzanne Evans, Culture Spokesman GLA member Peter Whittle and former UKIP candidate uh, for Cardiff, John Rees Evans. 0345 6060 and you can watch the whole debate on the LBC website at lbc.co.uk and on Facebook Live on the LBC Facebook page. Well, welcome to all four Hi. of you. We're going to get Hello. straight into it and go to the calls. Uh, Victoria, is put, you need to put your headphones on, by the way. All right. uh, it's, it's radio, after all, <laughs> even though people can watch. Uh, Victoria <laughs> is in Stansted. Victoria, what's your question? Oh, hello there. Good afternoon. Um, I agreed recently um, with Stephen Wolfe who um, claimed that UKIP is ungovernable and in a death spiral. And I wondered who you think is to blame for that state of affairs. Suzanne Evans. Ungovernable? You just watch me. I'll show you, Victoria. <laughs> it's definitely not ungovernable. You know, we might have had some troubles in the past, but all political parties go through tough spots. But uh, I think UKIP, we had four million voters at the general election. We have a great manifesto on which to build more policies. I think we have a real opportunity now because the Labour Party is so utterly failing working people in this country. I think this is a world of opportunity for UKIP out there. And if I'm leader, I cannot wait to get started. But with all of the things that have gone on since the referendum, Nigel Farage's will he, won't he sort of continue or not, uh, with what happened with Diane James, with the, the role of the National Executive Committee, which I know is a bit of a sort of Westminster bubble thing. But your party is seen by the outside world as in a complete and utter mess and ungovernable. But you don't seem to recognise that description. We have the chance to wipe the slate clean. We're here, all four of us all good candidates who I know can take the party forward. And that's where we must start from. We actually, I said wipe the slate clean. I think I think I actually want to clarify that. We have a great legacy that Nigel Farage has left us that we can build on. But now, chance for a new leader to perhaps take a well, slightly new approach. Hang on a minute, because you, you said that UKIP's image was toxic. That surely um, is Nigel Farage's legacy. No, well, you no, did no. it. I heard, I heard you say it myself. No, I, used, I, I didn't say that at all. I mean, why would I be in a party if I thought that was the you truth? You said in, the party I needs said, to shed its toxic image. image. You well, said it on the anti that's very different from saying it's toxic. We're talking well, about an image. And I'm in UKIP, and part of the reason I want to lead UKIP is because I want to show a wider range of people just how fantastic okay. UKIP is and uh, what great policies we um, have. John Rees Evans, most people listening to this programme, yeah. with respect, will have never mm -hmm. heard of you. Of course, why, sure. why do you think that, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, first of all, do you think that UKIP is ungovernable? And how can you, as somebody from who's relatively unknown, make it mm -hmm. governable? And the fact is, I think that if things continue the way they are, if we have business as usual, UKIP will indeed be ungovernable. I believe that we need to have major reform in UKIP, and I'm not talking about minor configurational changes. I'm talking about implementing a system of internal direct democracy. As long as potential leaders are always vying against each other to determine who should determine the future direction of the party, there will always be conflict. But if we transfer decision-making powers from the leadership to the membership, we will never be in conflict because everybody in this country so respects well in the Labour democracy, party, hasn't it? No, they don't have direct democracy in the Labour Party. UKIP would be the first political party in Britain to implement it. You understand what I mean? By I, direct I do democracy? understand what you mean, but um, what I meant by that was Labour has given its members far more power, and it actually hasn't helped them, has it? No, no. 
What I'm talking about has absolutely nothing to do what Labour, with what Labour has done. I'm talking about a highly systematic system whereby... You know, I don't search for conflict, that's for sure. It also... Hang on, let me finish. Who's unstable around the table? No, I'm not well, you saying said, that. You said you're stable, so that indicates you think maybe one or two of these aren't. No, it doesn't. But I think that the, basically... Well, why bring it up? Because it's what actually we need as a party. We need as a party a period of stability. But, was, we was need Nigel a period... Farage unstable? No, no, not at all. But you I just mean, you, you just said the one we... that brought up the words. So yes, therefore because that I differentiate you from other candidates. That's all I'm trying to point out. No, because uh, what you you the question you asked me, uh, Ian, was simply that we are a rabble, that we're ungovernable, okay. and all well, the rest of it. Do you want to retract that word? No, no, I do not want okay. to. We need a period of stability. We need a period, therefore, of morale boosting, and then we need to be inspired. And those three things are the important steps for you. Keep going towards the 2020 election. Do you election. think that you are more inspirational than Paul Nuttall? Um, I think that uh, I wouldn't be in this race unless I thought actually that I could do uh, the right job. I think we're all excellent can- he, candidates. He can be quite charismatic when he puts his mind right. to it, can't he? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We all have different skills. But I think that um, what I would say is that it's terribly important at the moment that we have just a period of calm and uh, of rebuilding. But okay. then after that has to well, come I, inspiration. I, I don't think four weeks of a leadership 